That's a now I can talk.
All right. There we go. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for uh, uh, filling out the survey. I'm glad that's uh, kind of uh, taken care of. So um, what I'd like to do is kind of uh, get started on um, the uh, two of the big ideas. Uh, we did, uh, we, well, I just say we did not do algorithms on Friday, where, which we were planning on, or Thursday rather. And that's because instead we had a more productive uh, catch-up day on programming, which I thought well, worked out a lot better. Um, so we'll do that, and we'll talk about the uh, programming big idea as well, which is what we're going to do today. Now, um, Thursday works so well that we'll have another day like that this week that we can just uh, uh, work on the code, catch up, and make sure that everything is uh, is, is going uh, smoothly. Okay. Um, the uh, other announcement I wanted to make is that uh, I put up in Wild Courses the links to uh, all the uh, programming assignments uh, for the week. Basically, um, last week we did units one and two. I'm looking at uh, unit uh, three this week, and um, and that will give us all, in fact, more than the uh, programming requirements that uh, the College Board uh, wants for AP CSP. Okay, so uh, that has pretty much everything we need. All right. Okay, so. Let's take a look at algorithms and what uh, what we're supposed to know about them, okay? Um, first thing I want to say is that algorithms really are fundamental to computing. In fact, uh, uh, in the uh, computer science major, we have a course called Algorithms, and uh, it is uh, the gateway to advanced uh, computer science. I mean, it just sits right there, and it's uh, the bottleneck, if you will. Everybody has to go through this, and it's... Uh, uh, in my mind, is being able to come up with your own algorithm is what differentiates a um, you know script kitty that can put together a couple of uh, of lines of code with somebody who can actually program right I mean this is this is where it's at okay now what exactly is an algorithm it's a sequence of instructions that solves a particular problem I want to emphasize solves a particular problem because um, you know different disciplines have different things that they accept as solutions right and uh, so you know you're in the social sciences perhaps uh, a survey. Uh, and the requisite analysis is the solution to a problem, is the answer to a question. Uh, in computing, the answers to questions, the solutions to problems are almost always, here's an algorithm that does it, okay? That's, that's what we consider to be a solution, okay? Now, example of an algorithm, uh, it might be something that looks at, uh, I have here historical records, uh, and finds the average temperature in June in Laramie, okay? So, uh, so how might one do that? Sequence of instructions. Well, let's take a look at every June day, look at its uh, average temperature of that particular day, and add it to a running total so that eventually we have the sum of all those. We divide by the total number of days that we looked at, and boom, there's your average temperature in June, right? Sequence of steps, right? So you saw the uh, kind of the uh, description right there, okay? Um, I might as well uh, kind of uh, do a spoilers here. What exactly is a program then? I mean, that sounded a lot like a program. And, uh, and the answer is that the distinction between algorithms and, and programs is really fine, okay? And uh, if you use a programming language to write it down, right, like Snap, for example, or Python or Java, if you write it down in one of those, then you have a program, right? If what you have in mind is something that can, can be written in one of those languages, then what you're talking about is an algorithm, right? So finding the, the average temperature in June, if you have a, a, a way of doing it, right, uh, it's an algorithm. If you actually write it down using one of those programming languages, then you end up with a program, right? That's the distinction. So, where does computational thinking fit? Right, so uh, computational thinking, where does that fit? Um, different people will give slightly different answers, but one of those answers is that it's at the algorithm stage. So you don't necessarily program, but you could if you wanted to, right? Uh, another answer is that it happens even a little bit before that. You may not be able to come up with the algorithm, but, uh, but you know that it's something that can be solved with an algorithm, and you understand this is the kind of thing that we can do with a computer, and then you can use that as part of a larger uh, setting and say, we'll solve this bigger problem by solving this part using a program and, and that part using people, for example, right? And now you're thinking computationally. 
because you see the proper role of computing and uh, and addressing. So there's you know that's uh, computational thinking is a magic word is very popular in education right now, and it means slightly different things to to different people, but. Uh, key among those is you have to be able to decide what can be solved computationally, which means even if you can't come up with it, you at least know that an algorithm can solve this, right? And that's that's like 50% of the way there. <laughs> you know? okay. All right. Now, here are some concepts that uh, the College Board expects you to know. And uh, we're actually going to go through this in more detail. So I just kind of want to give you an overview of what they are right now. Uh, the first thing that they badly want you to know is what a variable is, okay? And uh, both numeric and Boolean. So uh, we've seen that in, in, in some of the units, uh, programming labs that you've been doing, okay? You know, we, we use a variable to keep track of all sorts of things, uh, even as simple as a list of words that, um, you know, that belong to a certain uh, category. Um, and also Boolean variables, and we've seen a little bit of that. We've seen more Boolean expressions than variables. But, uh, but those are just variables that hold the value true or false, and that's all they hold, right? Uh, a lot of what we've seen are numeric variables. We've also seen string variables so that we can hold things like uh, words and list of words and letters and stuff like that, okay? Uh, those are, that's something that the, that, that's really fundamental to computing. Um, the, uh, the other part of that is, uh, and, and what's important here is not just the idea, but the names, sequence, selection, and iteration. And so sequence um, actually just has to do with this and then that and then that other thing, right? So one, two, three is just a sequence of steps. And uh, algorithms are built that way, right? We say, do this, and then we say, do that, and then we say, do that. And you've seen that all the time. So to do a square, move 100 steps, turn 90, move 100 steps, turn 90, keep doing that. Um, if you move 100 steps, move another 100 steps, and then turn 90, and then turn 90, you don't get a square, right? The actual sequence of steps is important. It has to be in this order. So sequence is an important kind of thing. Um, I should say that the College Board downplays sequence a little bit. Uh, they use the word, and they want you to know what they mean by that. But uh, when they talk about algorithms, they focused on selection and iteration, okay? And again, they'll use these words. So uh, when I'm talking to students, I don't use the word selection. I use ifs, right? And so what's a selection is an if statement. It means that I can select to go this way or that way, depending on some Boolean expression, right? So if x is less than 270, uh, do this. Oh, share my screen. That would be a great idea, wouldn't it? Uh, let's see. How do I do that? The button that says share screen. You're a genius. Thank you, guys. Sorry about that. I thought I was sharing already. Um, okay. So uh, with uh, selections, again, we're just making that choice. So if X is less than 270, go this way. Otherwise, go that way. Okay. So that's, uh, that's an if statement. Okay. Uh, iteration, I actually do use that word. Um, iteration is the, it's really the same thing as loops. Okay. So what kind of loops have we seen? We've seen four loops. We saw that on the first... Uh, lab with for i equals 1 to 10. That is a classic uh, looping structure. Um, with a for loop, with that kind of for loop anyway, you know how many times the loop will get executed. It's 10 times, OK? Um, there's a for each loop. And for example, if you have a list, then you say for each element of the list, do something, OK? And then there are while loops that loop uh, while a given condition is true. Uh, there's also what are known as until loops that loop until a given condition becomes true, right? So they only loop while it's false. Um, so those are the kind of looping constructs that we have. So, so you're expected to know about sequencing, step one, step two, step three, selection. If this happens, do that. Otherwise, do this other thing. And iteration, do this until something becomes true, right? I mean, those are the things that we need, OK? All right. Uh, other kinds of things that you're simply expected to know have to do with lists, okay? If you come from a different background, you might call those arrays, okay? That's what they're called in, say, uh, Java and C++. And C++. You might call them vectors. That's what they're known in other programming languages, uh, like Java and C++. Yeah, no, they have both, uh, as well as things like Python or um, uh, MATLAB, okay? Um, but essentially, they all look like this. And this is, this is the syntax that the College Board uses, okay? 
So uh, that little less than minus sign is supposed to be an arrow that's pointing to the left, okay? And it is the assignment operator, okay? In most programming languages, it is an equal sign, okay? But equal is reserved for equality checks in, in, in this syntax. So, you know, we just simply use that to mean assignment. So list becomes something that has one, two, four, eight. That is the nature of a list. It has a sequence of elements, okay? It is in order. Okay, so that really is one, two, four, eight. One, four, two, eight would be different. And duplicates matter. So one, two, two, four, eight would be a different list. Okay, so that's what a list is. It just has a number of elements. And the syntax that we often use is square bracket and then commas between the elements. Okay, uh, list square brackets of one. Remember, I just assigned list here. Okay, so list and then square bracket one, square bracket. Okay. Uh, what that means is the first element of list, okay? Um, that is what's used in the College Board exam. That is the first element of list, which means that it is this one, right? Because the list had one, two, four, eight. The first element is one, okay? The third element is four. The fourth element is eight, okay? Now, um, the elements start at first, second, third, fourth, okay? If you're a mathematician, that makes perfect sense. If I have a vector of three elements, I have x1, x2, x3, okay? If you're a computer scientist, um, if you have a vector of three elements, you have x0, x1, and x2. Computer scientists like to count starting at zero, okay? There is a very good reason for that, okay? It's not just because I'm a computer scientist. I can objectively say that that is simply better. You start counting at zero. But the college board said, no, 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 no. Everybody knows you start counting at one. So that's what they start at. Okay, so be careful with that. Some languages, many languages, particularly Java, Python, uh, JavaScript, what else can they possibly be using? Um, well, C++, you know, uh, I think those are the common text-based languages. They all start counting at zero, okay? So be careful with that, okay? Um, the, uh, uh, what you call it? Uh, snap starts counting at one, okay, and uh, block-based languages because they appeal to the non-computer scientists uh, start counting at one, right? Like everybody else does, okay? Is actually, I'm sorry, calculus books. Calculus books, yeah. The mathematicians count from one, right? Uh, so, so yeah. The, do mathematicians at any point count at zero? Sometimes. Sometimes. Oh, we've corrupted you. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. It happens. But, uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that's just something to be careful with because, uh, I mean, it, all, it, it always strikes me when I'm using an unfamiliar language. It's like, oh, okay, so how do you do it, <laughs> right? And just have to find out, right? So College Board starts at one. Okay, here is a, a, an operation that the College Board uses. Here's the list, and we add a value at a particular index. So, for example, here's one, two, four, eight. If I were to say insert to this list at index three the value 10, then the list would become one, two, 10, four, eight, okay? So this simply inserts an element somewhere in, in the list, okay? Uh, append, we actually don't need if we have insert, but append puts it at the end. So if I said append list 50, this would become one, two, four, eight, 50, okay? And so, there's no insert before, insert after. No, that, those are just the only uh, inserts. So uh, insert puts it at that location. So if you say three, then it puts it at location three, and everything will just get shoved over to the right, okay? Um, remove. Can we, how can we put Oh, you put their, they want to put comments on these, on these notes. Oh, put comments on these notes? No, they want to download their own copies. Yes, you, yes, you can now. I think so. They're on the, yeah, the, I mean, these notes are publicly accessible. In fact, I'm just accessing it off of the public website. Um, the, uh, I'll make sure that, that, that you have a link to it, okay? And uh, so you can do that, okay? All right, uh, remove just gets rid of an element. So remove list three. This list now becomes one, two, eight, because element three, which was the number four, got removed, okay? Length of the list, that just counts the number of elements. So this one, the length is four because it's got one, two, four, eight, that's four elements. And then there's for each item in list, then this will be a loop that will execute four times, 
okay? The first time item is gonna have the value one, the second time item has the value two, the third time item has the value four, and the fourth time item has the value eight. So that's how you can just iterate over all the elements of a list. Okay. So um, the reason that I say the College Board expects you to know this is because they'll actually give programs, right? Little programs that use lists and then say, what is the output of this, right? So if you don't, oh, and they might even say, uh, you know, Sally wants to write a program that does this. And here are four ways that Sally's trying to do it. Which one of these works, right? Or which two of these work and the other two don't work. And they'll be using lists and these uh, list operations to do the work. Okay. Um, the other kind of operations that they like to use is the ones that have to do with uh, robot movement. Okay. And uh, basically, that is turtle graphics. So we have forward, right, and left. Okay. Um, the only thing I have to tell you about those that's different than turtle graphics is that they go forward by one, they turn right by 90 degrees, they turn left by 90 degrees, and that's it. Okay. So unlike turtle graphics, you can't go forward by an arbitrary length, and you can't turn by an arbitrary amount, okay? It's always straight, turn by 90 degrees, either right or left, okay? So that's what these functions do. In addition, there are the functions can move, uh, which, or well, there is the function can move that takes an argument left or right, and what it tells you is, can the turtle move left? And uh, what that means is, let's say that I'm in a hallway, I can look left and there's a hallway in that direction, then yes, it can move in that direction. If there's a wall in that direction, then the answer is no. If it's the edge of the world in that direction, the answer is no, right? But, uh, but you can do an if statement. If I can move left, then turn left and go forward, and that's guaranteed to work, okay? So, that's, uh, so these are just uh, robot-style primitives. And uh, the classic question that the, that the College Board likes to ask is, here is a maze, here is where the robot is starting, here is where the robot wants to get to, which one of these programs gets the robot safely to that location, okay? Or they might say, here is a program, here is a maze, at the conclusion of this program, where is the robot? And you have to say where, is, where it is and where it's facing, right? So those are the kinds of questions that you might find. All right, the last thing that the College Board expects you to know is how to create and use functions or procedures. And again, uh, the, just the reason that they expect you to know that, you know, mm -hmm. is, is because they will uh, write a function and then use it in their code and say, where does the turtle end up after doing this, okay? Okay, so um, actually, I think as you can see, there's not a lot uh, in the terms of algorithms that you need to know, which is, which is kind of nice. They're fairly limited. And uh, that really just tests your, your um, uh, ability to reason from a, a small uh, set of primitives, okay? Now, um, the next little section here is about a specific algorithms that are kind of well-known in computer science, okay? Uh, these are algorithms that, um, you know, we ask freshmen to write, and by the time they're juniors, uh, we just call them by name, and, and they know exactly what we're talking about, and just kind of use them incrementally. So, so here they are. Uh, the first one just simply finds the maximum of two variables. So I have two variables, x and y. I need to know what the maximum value is. And that is just an excuse to write an if statement. If x is greater than y, then the maximum is x, right? If x is less than y, or rather if x is not greater than y, then the maximum is y, right? Uh, I wrote it here as if I was writing a function. So return x, return y. So if you look at this entire expression, if x is greater than y, then the entire expression is the value is x. Otherwise, the value is y. So that is exactly the maximum of those two things. Okay? Um, that's not a hard algorithm, right? Obviously, it is just simply an application of an if statement. Okay? So that's all there is to that. Now, somewhat more interesting is this. Find the maximum of a list, okay? And there's a couple of different ways of writing it. Uh, the way I'm doing it is I start out with a variable max, and I say max is whatever the first element of the list is, a sub one, okay? Um, so the way that I think of max is, it is the maximum value that I've seen of the list, okay? And uh, so now, for i goes from one to n, we've seen that for loop, okay? I could have also used the for each, 
item in, in A, okay? I could have done that, okay? But I used the indexing. So I has the index values from one to N, and then I look at A sub I. So the first time through the loop, I'm looking at A sub one, the second time I look at A sub two, the third time I look at A sub three, and so on. If A sub I is greater than max, then what does that mean? Max is the largest value I've seen so far, but now I'm looking at A sub I, and I discovered that A sub I is bigger, okay? So that means that the maximum is actually A sub I, because that now is the largest value I've seen so far, right? And I just do that. At the end of this loop, I've seen every single element in the array. Max is the highest one I've seen so far. I've seen them all now, right, at the end of the loop. So I can now safely say that max really is the biggest element in the list. It is the maximum one of the list, okay? So uh, there are many algorithms that I can write like this. Like, for example, find the minimum, okay, right? And what they do is walk through each element of the list, and then inside of that, do an if statement or do something to keep an accumulator going, the thing I've seen up to this point, okay? So that's another kind of classic algorithm you're expected to be able to do. Find the maximum of the list, find the blah of a list, okay? All right, uh, the next one is a trick, and it is just a trick. And the trick is how do I swap the value of two variables? I have x and y, let's say that x is equal to 10, y is equal to 20. After I swap them, x will be equal to 20, y will be equal to 10, right? And so um, this is kind of a challenge that you can give uh, you know, beginning programmers. And uh, almost all solutions that, that you come up with are wrong, okay? So, so, so eventually you just learn this idea. And the idea is to use what's known as a temporary variable. This is another variable, a third variable that we don't care about, right? So we say this temporary variable gets the value x, okay? And then x gets the value y, and then y gets the value x, okay? Uh, oops, I actually got it wrong, sorry. Uh, y gets the value temp, okay? Um, let me fix that. Programming is hard. Okay, so um, let me tell you why this doesn't work, okay? So x has the value 10, y has the value 20. After x gets y, then x will have 20 and y will have 20, right? Because x just got the value of y. And then y gets the value of x. Well, y gets the value of x and x is 20, so y just gets 20 again. So what happens is that both x and y become 20 after those statements, right? That's why we need the temp, right? The temp gets x, so x, temp, x is 10, temp is 10, x gets y, so now x has 20, and now y gets, and that's the important thing here, that should be temp, y gets temp, y gets 10, right? And so now at the end of that, they did indeed get swapped, okay? So, so this is, like I said, a standard trick that, um, that just in computer science you just need to know, okay? Now, um, one of the reasons you need to know that is because there is the idea of sorting a list, okay? Now, sorting is one of those things that's kind of a classic algorithm, and historically, it, uh, a large amount of uh, interest was devoted to it. Um, and so that's part of the reason that it's important. Uh, but the other part is, you know, why do we spend so much time talking about sorting? Is because if you have a sorted list, things become a lot easier, okay? So, so let me do, before I actually get to sorting, let me just tell you that finding an element in a list is not that hard. In fact, it's very simple to find in the maximum element of a list. What we do is we look at each element of the list. So we have a for loop and check a sub i, right? So for each element of the list, if it happens to be equal to the one that I'm looking for, right, then, oh, I found it, is i. i is the index of that element in the list. So if I have one, two, four, eight, and I said look up four, then it will actually say I found it, it's in position three right? That's what i is, the position in the array of x, okay? So uh, this is how I find an element in a list. Very, very easy, okay? But now suppose that the list is very large. It's got, you know, say a million elements. Then going through a million elements to try to find the one that you want is not very wise, okay? Um, now, um, your students won't be able to relate to this, okay? But, uh, but I think we can, okay? Um, it's like having a phone book, right? 
And if you want to find somebody's phone number in the phone book, you do not start in the first page and then just kind of keep flipping through until you find them, right? You take advantage of the fact that the names in the phone book are sorted, okay? Like I said, your students can relate to this because they've never seen a phone book, right? So my next best uh, uh, example is a dictionary, right? And again, if you want to find the definition of a word in a dictionary, you do not start in the first page and then work your way until you find the word, right? You kind of use your, your skills here. So it's like, oh, it starts with an E. So it's probably somewhere in here and then zero in using the fact that the dictionary is in order until you find the right page, okay? Um, unfortunately, even that might be too much for the students because, you know, they have phones that can look up words if they need to. Um, library cards? No, 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 they've never seen a library card either. So actually, I'm gonna leave that as a homework for you guys. Uh, I don't know how to bridge this generational gap, okay? But, uh, but uh, students today, I don't think have had the experience of having to find something where they are aided by the fact that they're already in, in order, okay? Uh, I, I know that we all did, right, a long, long time ago. We at least remember what a phone book looks like. Yeah. I have to get a library card to go into the Cheyenne Library. You actually have to get a library card in a real, yeah. honest-to-goodness yeah. library? My God. I haven't seen that in forever. I had to prove that I had a Laramie. Oh, no. I, an act, yeah, sorry. What I meant was the uh, index cards to find oh, books. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Those are gone, right? You know, so, yeah. Actually, so they're being reused. People write on the back of them. People write on the back of them. Okay. So they're scratch paper now. Right, right. Excellent. So, so anyway, so that's, uh, like I said, please get back to me if you can think of a really good example that resonates with today's uh, students, okay? But, uh, but we know that if the items are in order, we can actually get to them more easily. I'll talk about this little algorithm later, but this is the one that finds things in a list when the list is guaranteed to be in order. As you can see, it's a bit more complicated than this one. But just to give you an example, um, if you have numbers from one to, say, 1,000, okay, then it would take on the average 500 steps to find it if you're simply looking at the first, then the second, then the third, right? But if you use this algorithm, it takes on average 10 steps to find it. How about if you link a table on your graphing calculator and it goes one, two, three, four, five, it just iterates? Ah. Not good enough? Maybe that would work. We have a suggestion to use a table and a graphing calculator to show that example. That might work really, really well. You know, and, and it's, using, it's using something they actually use, yeah. So, you know, again, keep, keep the ideas coming because uh, um, I'm finding that I struggle with this quite a bit sometimes. And like I'll be talking to my database class, a bunch of seniors, so they're, you know, 22-year-olds. Oh, and it's like, um, yeah, just filled out. Down. I'll keep writing those down. Okay, so, so anyway. The, um, oh, actually, I wanted to make this even more dramatic. I talked about a 1,000, right? Uh, what if I have a million entries? Then on average, it takes 500,000 to find it if you start at the beginning and go to the second one, go to the third. Uh, is, they're still that way on the shelf. They're still that way on the shelf? Oh, you actually, yeah. I know which number I'm looking for, but I still need to find it. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. That might be the right uh, uh, metaphor. Um, okay, so let's see. Where was I? Yeah. I have a million things I'm going to look at in an array. If I do it using a linear search, start at the beginning, go to the end, it takes 500,000 on average, right? You'll believe that? You know, that seems pretty reasonable, right? Um, if you use the other technique, it takes 20 steps on average, right? So 500,000 versus 20, I'll take the 20, okay? And, and if you go even bigger, right? So uh, by the time you have enough elements to fill the... Uh, the um, say the u.s uh federal uh deficit uh you know uh so that's what 20 trillion okay so it would take 10 trillion steps on average and if you do it the other way it's going to be what a uh, million to about 40 right so so yeah it's pretty cool right so so anyway um you do want to use uh you do want things to be sorted when you can afford it okay so then that brings up the problem how do i get things sorted okay so so here we are this is bubble sort okay now before you read this code let me just tell you what i'm doing uh what i'm doing is i say um at the very beginning okay 
Oh, let, I'm sorry. Let me take a look at it real fast. Okay. So uh, what I'm actually doing is I'm comparing uh, two elements of the list that are next to each other, right? And I'm going to uh, rearrange them so that the largest one is at the bottom. Okay? You know. So, uh, so let's look at elements one and two. Uh, whichever one of those two elements is a bigger one, I'm going to put in position two. Okay? And uh, I'm going to uh, keep doing that as I go all the way down the list. So then I'll make the biggest one and I'll put it in. So I compare two and three. And the biggest one of those will go into position three. Okay? Now think about what position three has at that point. Right? It has the biggest one of one and two went into position two. And then I compare two and three. And the biggest one went into position three. So position three actually is the biggest one of one, two, and three. Okay? And then we compare three with four. Again, the biggest one is going to go into position four. And we keep doing that until we get to the end. When we get to the end, what happens is that the largest element is actually in the last place. Okay? So now what I can do is um, kind of uh, do it again, but look at uh, positions uh, one, and I don't have to consider uh, position n. All I have to do is go to n minus 1. Okay? And uh, I'll compare 1 and 2, 2 and 3, 3 and 4, etc. until I get to n minus 2 and n minus 1, and the largest one goes into position n minus 1. Okay? And, um, and if I do it again, right, then the next largest will go into position n minus 2, do it again, the next largest goes into position n minus 3. And when I do that n times, then I've actually sorted my list. Okay? So, so this is essentially how that algorithm works. Uh, for i equals 1 to n, that's that outer loop that says put something in the right position. And then for j equals i to n, um, that's what actually going to, um, to, uh, to go over the ones that I haven't uh, settled yet, the position I haven't settled yet. Uh, the way I described the algorithm, I should have gone from i equals 1 to n minus i. Okay? And then I simply compare um, those two uh, elements, and I swap them, right? I swap them by taking the biggest one there, okay? Um, I actually had to be, uh, uh, I had to think about the way I wanted to describe it, and, and I might actually give it another shot here. And the reason is that there's uh, several different ways of writing this algorithm that kind of all work, and they're all uh, pretty similar. And um, pretty much any of those is, is appropriate. So. Um, Okay, um, let me tell you what this specific version of it does, okay? Um, the, the one that I described is kind of the classic bubble sort. This one isn't, and I don't actually know the name for it, okay? Maybe, maybe one of you does. It might be what goes in your selection sort. Uh, but here, what we're doing is this. Uh, A sub i is what we're going to set correctly, okay? So let's look at the first time. i is equal to 1, okay? And then what I do is I go for j equals i to n, so starting at position 1, and I simply try to find uh, something that's smaller than a sub i. So if a sub i is bigger than a sub j, then I swap them. Okay? And then I consider j goes from 1 to n, so now it's 2. If a sub 1 is greater than a sub 2, I swap them. If a sub 1 is greater than a sub 3, I swap them. a sub 1 is greater than a sub 4, I swap them, right? If a sub 1 is smaller, I don't swap them. It's only when a sub 1 is bigger. So what happens at the end of this inner loop, okay, what happens at the end of that one is that if any of those values was, was smaller than a sub i, we swapped it with a sub i, okay? So at the end, a sub i, which was a sub 1, has the smallest element, period, okay? Okay, then i becomes 2. We do it again. We look at everything and compare it to a sub 2, right? But we're not going to compare it with a sub 1. We already know that a sub 1 is the smallest one. That's why this goes from j equals 1 to n. I'm sorry, i to n. Okay? So, um, so at the end, uh, a sub 2 is going to have the smallest value between 2 and n, which is actually the second smallest value in the entire list. Then i becomes 3, and we do it again. So uh, when I'm finished, this will actually have all of the items in order. Okay? Because each time through the loop, each time through this outer loop, we find the i smallest element and make sure that ends up in a sub i. Okay, so uh, so this is a way of sorting. Okay, so it's um, 
it's kind of a, an important routine and uh, it shows up in kind of the college board. Okay. Uh, this one shows up a lot, by the way, this has a name, it's called linear search. Okay. And all we're doing is for i equals one to n, if the element at position i of the array is the one I'm looking for, then I found it. Okay. At the end of the loop, I'm sorry, I did not find it. Okay. It was not there. Okay. So now this is the harder way to find an element in a list. It only works when the list is sorted, and it is, and I'm not using the word lightly, it is exponentially faster than linear search, okay? Literally, it is exponentially faster. So that's why instead of going from, from 1,000 to a, to a million, right, uh, it, it only doubles as opposed to going up by a factor of three. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, how does it work? Um, the way that it works is that we start by saying the answer has to be somewhere in this range between a sub low and a sub high, okay? So at the very beginning, all I can tell you is that the answer has to be somewhere between a sub 1 and a sub n, right? That makes sense. That's, where, that's the area that I'm looking for it, right? Uh, and then we hop into a while loop, and, and this is the entire key right here. We look at mid, which is low plus high divided by two. That's the midpoint, okay? So let's say that I have 1,000 elements, right? Then mid is going to be 500 the first time, okay? It really is that simple. It's just halfway between low and high, okay? And, and then I compare and I say, okay, so if I look at the value that's in the middle of the array, if that value happens to be less than X, then what do I know? Well, I know that it doesn't make any sense to look at any value between a1, a2, a3, up to a sub mid, because a sub mid is already smaller than x, and a1 is smaller than a sub mid, a2 is smaller than a sub mid, so all of those are also gonna be smaller, okay? So that means that my low estimate is gonna get quite a bit bigger than it used to be. It is now going to be mid plus one, okay? I don't, you know, I don't need to look at any of the values between a1 and a mid, I could rule all those out by just observing that a sub mid is too small, okay? So low becomes bigger than mid, right? The data has to be, or the value x has to be between a sub mid plus one and a sub high, right? I was able to rule out half of them, okay? Um, here, I'm able to rule out the other half. If a sub mid is too big, then there's no point looking at a sub mid plus one, a sub mid plus two, and so on, right? So, uh, so all I have to do is look at a sub low to mid minus one. So that's why low and high changed, okay? Um, otherwise, well, if it wasn't too small and it wasn't too big, then I actually did find it, okay? So just return that. Here it is, it's in position 500, I got lucky, right? If I didn't get lucky, a sub 500 was too small, then it has to be between a sub 500 and one and a sub 1,000, right? And I'm gonna guess again by looking at a sub 750, and that's how I'm gonna find it, okay? So, uh, so, so we just keep doing this, right? We say it's somewhere in this range, every time we split the range in half, okay? And we say, well, it's gotta be on this half. And we just keep splitting the range in half so, so that eventually we have just one thing we're looking at, right? And then if that's not it, then we exit the loop and return zero, okay? We could not find it, okay? So, so that's how this algorithm works, okay? Um, the reason that it's much, much faster is that if you're doing linear search, with every comparison, all I can do is rule out one possibility, right? If you're using this, which is called binary search, if you're using binary search, then with each comparison, we get rid of half of the possibilities, okay? We can only do that if it's in order, Right? If it's not in order, then we don't get away with it, right? But if it is in order, then fantastic. That's why sorting is so important. Okay, uh, I actually lied a little bit, okay? Um, the, uh, you and your students actually don't need to know how to code binary search, okay? Um, it's great if you do. It's great if you have the idea for it. And just as an exercise, uh, I actually recommend playing the uh, guessing game, number guessing game, where somebody Fix the number between one and a thousand, for example. Okay, start small, one and a, one and ten. Okay, and we have to guess what the number is. And let's say we pick eight, and so you guess right. And if you guess at random, you might say, "Oh, did you guess three? No. Did you guess seven? No. Did you guess four? No." Right. Uh, but if you guess systematically, 
five because it's halfway between one and ten. They say, no, it's higher. Okay. So it's between five and ten. Seven. No, it's higher. Okay. Between seven and ten. Um, let's say you guess uh, nine, right? Nope. That's too high. Between seven and nine, eight. Boom. Nailed it, right? Uh, unfortunately, the average is four steps on that one, which is not significantly better than five, which you would get by just going one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. All right, now try it with 100, right? That's 50 versus seven. Okay, that's pretty nice. Uh, let's try it with 1,000. That's 500 versus 10, okay? And, and, and then your students really do get a visceral feel for this works much better, okay? Um, I have to warn you, uh, I, I usually like to bet my students that I can guess the number in like 10 steps, but I've learned to fudge. Uh, I say 20 steps. Um, and, uh, and it's still impressive, right? Between one and a thousand and you get it in 20. Wow. And these are freshmen. I can impress them with this. And the reason is because, uh, I am not a human calculator. So, you know, it's like halfway between one and a thousand, not a problem. 500 halfway between 500 and a thousand. No problem. 750 halfway between 500 and 750. <laughs> okay. And I have to think really fast. Okay. Let's see. What is it? You know, let's see. It's about one, uh, uh 625, right? Uh, so I figured at that point, if I'm under pressure, I can go 700, right? You know, it's, it's close enough. And so I need 20 guesses to be able to do it. Um, if you're better at arithmetic than I am, you can stick to 10. That, 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 that works. Okay. Um, but anyway, like I said, what you need to know is that binary search exists, that linear search always works. Binary search is much faster. Linear search works for any list. Binary search works only for sorted lists. And what really what they're after is this. You understand the trade-offs, right? Sorting a list is expensive, but it means I can search it faster. Okay? That's what they really want you to know. Okay, so how do they assess all this? They're going to have multiple choice questions, and these are the kinds of problems that they have. Any algorithms that I mentioned, they can just bring up. Okay? Um, they can show you a simple algorithm, and they'll actually make stuff up that have, makes no sense whatsoever. You know, if X is less than seven, then if X is greater than four, print hello, else print goodbye, else if X is, you know, and all they want you to be able to do is go through the if statements and say, the answer is goodbye, okay? So that's, uh, that's something that they, they like to do, okay? Um, they might also show you like a maze and a robot, run the program and say, where does the robot end up, okay? Um, and, and I think the harder ones, as they'll actually describe algorithms, and here's, here's the way they might describe it. There are 10 students, and we want to find the average height of the students in inches, okay? So each student writes down his or her height on a piece of paper, okay? And then, um, you know, the first uh, student gives his paper to the second student. The second student adds the two amounts, writes those in the card. Then he gives that to the third student, the third student writes the two amounts, puts that in his card, writes it to the next student, and so on. And then the last student divides the total by 10. That's one algorithm, right? Another algorithm might be students get together in pairs and add up their um, heights, okay? And then each pair, one of the students sits down. Or the remaining students, they pair up and they do this, right? And uh, if a student does not have somebody to pair up with, then he or she just stands on their own and waits, right? Maybe at the next round, he or she can pair up with someone, right? At the end, there's only one student left. That student divides the number by 10. That's another way to compute the average, right? Uh, different way. Two students compute the average among themselves, right? And then they average those totals and they keep averaging, you know? And so that's, uh, that's another way. And then they'll have uh, the algorithm A, B, C, and D. Which algorithm works? Which ones don't, right? That might be kind of uh, the answer. Okay. All right. Um, the other part is in the create task. And students are asked to actually identify an algorithm in their code. Okay. So it's not enough to just submit the code. They have to go to part of the code and say, here is an algorithm. Right here. You can see it. Okay. Now, like I said, anything is an algorithm. X equals three is a quote algorithm, right? It has sequencing. Uh, no. The college board says it has to be a, quote, substantial algorithm. And how do you know what's substantial? So here's what it boils down to. 
there has to be some math or logic. Okay, I think this is going to get more rigorous. Right now, the way they define math or logic is it has math if there is an arithmetic operation in it somewhere. For example, x equals x plus one. Yep, that counts. Math occurred. Okay, I think that will get tightened, and it has to be more math. But at least for now, that's considered sufficient. Okay, logic. If there's an if statement or a while loop, there's logic taking place. Okay, if there is a Boolean operator like and or not, uh, logic is definitely taking place. Okay, so so that's uh, so the algorithm has to have one of those, right? So if your algorithm is f equals mass times acceleration, it has arithmetic. It doesn't have logic. Okay, and by the way, there must be at least two steps. So f equals ma would not count. Okay. There's only one step, right? Um, the algorithm has to have two other algorithms working in concert, okay? That's a big one, okay? So F equals MA doesn't cut it, right? Um, now here's something that would. Step one, mass equals some combination of things to compute the mass of the object. Step two, acceleration equals some kind of sequence of steps to figure out the acceleration, right? Step three, F equals MA, right? That works, right? F equals MA has math. Mass equals something. That's an algorithm. That's the nested algorithm that's being used to compute the mass of the thing. Maybe you have to add the mass of the torso and the limbs and the heads to make it all work out, okay? Acceleration, maybe you got your current position, your previous position, and the position before that, you have to do a couple of, uh, of um, uh, differences to be able to get acceleration from that, but the boom, you got it, okay? So two algorithms, one to compute the mass, one to compute the acceleration, and then the master algorithm that uses those two to compute the force. That would work, okay? Uh, in the same spirit, let me show you this algorithm. Um, when I was uh, writing this, I was thinking in terms of uh, statistics, okay? Uh, so here is a whole bunch of exam grades, and I would like to know kind of uh, statistics information about this. One way will be to convert into z-scores so that I can tell what students are doing really, really well and what students are doing really, really poorly, okay, so that I can uh, effectively address the, uh, the problems, right? So here's how I do it. Uh, first thing is I figure out the average or the mean of the exams, okay? So exams is a list of numbers, right, that have the grades. So M gets that value, that's the mean. S is my standard deviation of the exams. Um, and then uh, I do the following. I'm computing a list of z-scores, right? So I start with an empty list. For each exam in exams, I compute the z-score right here. It's just subtract the median, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the mean, and then divide by the standard deviation. And I append that result to the list ZS, which is the list of Z-scores, okay? I actually picked this algorithm because uh, this part here is non-trivial, right? Um, this part here is actually adding all sorts of elements, collecting a whole bunch of things in a list, right? Uh, I'm using the um, uh, College Board approved primitive for appending to a list, okay? The method append, ZS, and then the value. Uh, here is sub-algorithm number one, how to compute the average number from a list, okay? And you see, it's not a very hard algorithm, right? We just add all the elements and divide by the number of elements. It's, it's a trivial algorithm, but it counts, right? Standard deviation is a slightly more complicated algorithm, right? Because we have to find the mean first. Uh, by the way, I could have passed it as an input parameter here, right? I could have done that, and that would be better, right? But, but I didn't, just to show you that you don't have to be writing really good algorithms. To, to pass this uh, thing, right? Inside standard deviation, we're actually gonna have to find the mean and then go back and compute x sub i minus mean squared, total those up, divide by n minus one, right? That's what's happening here, okay? And then convert that to z scores, right? So you can easily see that there's three algorithms. I recommend to make the two sub-algorithms obvious, to put them inside subroutines, okay? That way we're not guessing. I'm trying to count them. Oh, is this what they meant by a sub-algorithm? This is the way that you get the z-score, right? If you have the mean and the standard deviation. I guess it's got arithmetic. I guess that, oh, it's got two steps. You subtract and then divide. So yeah, I could call that an algorithm, right? Don't make the AP readers have to guess what you mean, 
right? If you want to get the points, make it obvious. Here's point one, here's point two, here's point three. Give me, okay? And then they will, okay? So, uh, so anyway, um, I want to emphasize this. If you pick a problem for the create task or your students pick a problem for the create task and nowhere in there is there an algorithm that's like this complicated, okay? Then send them back and tell them, you know, you should pick a different thing, right? Or you should embellish what you're working on so that there is a place that has an algorithm that's at least this complex, right? That way you can fulfill the needs of the create task, get your points, right? You know, and uh, I actually saw uh, a response to, it wasn't to create, it was to the explore task, but it was basically after choosing my explore task topic, I realized that, uh, you know, I had nothing to say for this question. So, um, so I don't have an answer. Well, I don't have points for you, you know, and, uh, and, I, and I feel bad for you because I can't come up with an answer either based on your choice of topic. It's just a bad topic, right? Pick a better topic. You know what the questions are ahead of time, okay? So, so, you know, this, I see this as a, as a, you know, kind of a floor on the, on the complication, right? If there was no floor, then the students could pick a program that reads in two numbers, adds them and prints the result, right? Ta-da, I did an algorithm, you know, no, you didn't. So, uh, so there's gotta be a floor that says you at least have to aim this high, right? Please aim higher, but at least you have to aim this high. So, so that's what that is. All right, um, any questions on the algorithm section? Yeah. They didn't catch that, sorry. Do I? You have to write somewhere else what you mean deviation. Ah, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, yes, you would. Okay. So, so what you would do is you would circle this algorithm and um, <laughs> do them in circle. That's, that's what the college board wants you to do. And then you'll circle the definition of mean and the definition of standard deviation. Okay. And if those are built in in your programming language, then this is actually not a good example. Right, because then you don't have two sub algorithms. You got one for free, right? And that's not allowed. Okay. But you could, even if it's there, you could. Yeah. Define your own. Even if it's there, you could just define it yourself, right? Just you know, just to prove a point, that would be okay, right? Like if you're in Python, you can just call mean, but uh, but you could, you, you know, for the College Board, you would actually have to write it so that they would count it as one of your algorithms, right? And um, yeah. Were there any questions on the chat? Yes, we do. I think I've been taking them. You've already taken them? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I said something about how the, a way to find the square root of a number oh, yeah. uses bisection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same thing in more maybe familiar setting. Yeah, the, the bisection root finding thing is exactly binary search. It's the same algorithm, in a, just in a slightly different trappings. And they've also figured out how to go to the page where you are now. Good, good. It was a little hitch because when we got to the place where it said curriculum algorithm, you know, at list, mm -hmm. it's in black, not blue. I see. And so they, don't so see they didn't realize list. that there were links. Yes. I'll try to, I'll try to got, fix that. We've gotten okay. that. I'll try to fix that so that it's more obvious. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let's look at programming. Uh, by the way, about 20% of the questions in the multiple choice test are in programming. 20% of the questions are in algorithms, right? So those two little big ideas account for 40% of the entire exam. So even though they're all big, they're not equally weighted when it comes to testing, right? These are, this is the mid of the exam, okay? Now, um, programming is just how we describe the algorithms to computers. So um, is really the way that we create artifacts, right? I mean, this, these are the kinds of things we do. Like I said, when we solve a problem, the solution is the algorithm, but uh, what you deliver to the customer is an actual program that implements that algorithm in some computer language, okay? Now, uh, there's not a lot to talk about in programming because even though that they're split, right? The truth is that algorithms are where it's at. Programming is just a skill of writing the algorithm down in a language that a computer understands. So, so you need a programming language. That's the whole point of programming languages. That's how we, um, we write down algorithms, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't care about them. Um, turns out that there's uh, many different 
uh, programming languages, right? Uh, for this particular exam, CS principles, the College Board does not care what programming language you use. Um, and we've gotten some very interesting responses from students. Like uh, we've seen things like, um, well, uh, what I would call traditional programming languages like Java, C++, maybe Python, okay? I mean, we saw Python responses. I'm just debating whether Python is traditional or not. Uh, I think it is now. JavaScript, okay? Uh, we also saw Snap, Scratch, Alice. These are, you know, block space languages. Code.org, which is another block space language similar to those, okay? And then there are absolute odd things, MATLAB, okay? which uh, engineers use, but why would a high school student be using MATLAB, okay? Um, if that's not enough, LabVIEW. LabVIEW is a graphical language that engineers and scientists like to use to run their experiments. Why is a high school student even aware of LabVIEW? I don't know, but they used it to, uh, to actually I do know the answer to that, uh, FLL. Uh, there's also used in, uh, in, in FLL, so maybe that's where they learned it. And, and off they went to do their, their thing. Um, so the, uh, the possibilities are really endless. Uh, the, uh, I, I recommend that you stick with languages that are at least traditional enough to have procedures, right? So that it's easier to do abstractions, okay? But other than that, it's wide open, okay? Now, two broad categories that you see are text-based languages. These are the ones that uh, uh, computer people call, quote, real programming languages, right? And then there are block space languages, which are the ones where you drag blocks and put them in order, like Snap. Okay. Um, the, um, the only people that really complain about block space languages not being real are uh, higher ed professors who haven't tried them, okay? Who then who just know that it can't possibly be real programming because it's too easy. And every once in a while, you get the, uh, the high school kid know it all, right? Uh, I'm sure you have met him or her who uh, has learned how to program in JavaScript and think that they know as much as somebody who spent four years in college learning how to program and graduating. And since they already know JavaScript, which is the only language worth learning anyway, then things like Snap that involve drag and dropping are beneath them. So, but other than that, most people are responsive and prefer to block space languages. Okay. Uh, however, the College Board is very clear. They're equivalent, and they're so clear that they're going to ask questions such as, Sally is thinking of writing a program to find the average of a list. What should she use? A, a text-based language, because text-based languages operate better on lists. B, you know, a block-based language, because block-based languages are better for doing arithmetic operations like average. And then eventually D, it doesn't matter. Sally can pick whatever language she wants. That is the correct answer, okay? So, uh, so anyway, that, uh, that will come. Okay, uh, other categories include high level and low level, right? What do we mean by that? A high level language tries to be close to the human. A low level language is close to the computer, right? In the old days, programming languages were wires that you would unplug and plug into a different place. So it was actually a circuit that you were building. That was the program, okay? That is really close to the computer. I would call that a low-level programming language. Um, the first kind of real high-level programming languages was Fortran. Fortran stands for Formula Translation, Fortran. And the idea was that you could type in force equals mass times acceleration, and it would do that, right? It would actually take the mass and the acceleration, multiply them, and put the result in force. Or you could say force equals 